Right, I think we'll make a start. And if there, if there are any late joiners, um, they, they'll hopefully catch catch up with us. Um, so my name's Heather Powell. I'm a partner with Blick Rosenberg and I head up the property and construction team. Um, and when myself and Andy Sanford heard about the financial offering, finance offering from Econocom, we thought it would be lovely to share it with our clients um, because it's a slightly different finance offering. So we're absolutely delighted that Francis Weston can join us today to talk us through some what the type of finance they're able to offer and also some examples so you can actually see how it is used in practice. Um, 2020 saw many, many businesses put investment on hold due to lack of cash, they were having actually invest in their lockdown costs and also a lack of confidence about what is the marketplace going to be like, what is going to be needed going forward. Um, so we see when talking to our clients that there are many businesses are now talking about making investments in 2021, in particular in the different ways of working. Um, obviously, ahead of the property and construction sector, thinking about modern methods of construction. But we're also seeing it in professional firms and across the piece in terms of CRM systems and also systems that help this agile working that we've all had to embrace. Um, and and the, these types of projects are a play to the strength of the Econocom offering. Um, particularly for projects where banks are perhaps not willing or not able to fund. Um, so just a little bit of admin, which I have skipped over. On the right hand side, you should see a dashboard. Um, and in, in there, one of the options is questions. We're going to get a presentation from Francis, and then we would really love to be able to discuss some of the questions that are posted. Um, if we're not able to answer all of them, we will come back to you one to one. But please post in there any questions that you that occur to you as the presentation goes through or any questions that you want answered. And it's the other reason why you you, you booked onto this this webinar. So, yeah, I, I um, express my view about businesses wanting to invest. But what I'd actually like to know is how many of you are thinking about investing in 2021? So we've got a little poll just to give us a feel for the audience that we're speaking to. And um, so first question, and uh, none of the panelists can vote on this, but did you cut back on investment in 2020? If you could pick one of those options, that would be great. So all 14% some, 64%, so that is exactly in line with the, the type of feedback we're getting from our clients. And our second question, Charlotte. Do you need to invest in software, hardware, other capital items in 2021? As we thought, a lot, you know, a lot of businesses, because we've changed our business models, need to make some need to make investment. And last, last question, please, Charlotte. If yes, how do you intend to fund the investment? What are your thoughts at the moment about how you how you'll fund it? Own working capital, lovely position to be in. Shareholders loans, so new money coming in from the shareholders or organised uh, external finance. So 67% from your own working capital. I wonder if that's because some of you feel that external finance wouldn't be available at the right price. Um, but external finance, 33%. Thank you all very, very much for, for responding to that. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Francis Weston, who's the MD of UK and US for Econocom, who will talk us through their finance offering, which is a little bit different, I think it's fair to say, Francis, to that of certainly the high street banks. Thank you very much, Francis. Thank you so much, Heather, and thank you so much uh, to Andy for allowing me to come in and share a little bit of my insight with you. So I'm gonna start a little bit about myself and then we'll go into the, the slideshow. So I am um, 
uh, a banker by heart. So I started uh, in banking uh, as a trader and I worked across uh, retail, corporate and investment banking for most of my career. I just started at Econocom in March of 2020. So I got exactly one week in the office until um, lockdown happened and it's and it was all about remote working and working with our clients in a different way, albeit still trying to um, assist in the day-to-day -day technology needs of our clients. So the reason why I was attracted to Econocom is particularly because there is this massive change in technology that we've all seen you know happen happen over the past few decades and i wanted to be a part of it in a more meaningful way and knowing the history of econocom it allowed me to really you know play a part a more meaningful part um uh, than i had previously in in banking so i think we're going to start with the slides and i'll talk to you a little bit more about econocom and you know where where we come from and how um uh in our story essentially so let's move on quickly uh, and move into a little bit of our, you know, top or high level, high level numbers. So, in uh, 2019, our revenue was three billion, and the story behind that is a simple one. It started in 1974 with a gentleman called uh, Jean-Louis Bouchard, who still is the chairman of the firm today. Um, we went from a private company into a listing in Belgium, in Brussels, uh, fairly quickly. Now, Jean-Louis' vision was a very simple one. It was in those days, the rooms that you and I are sitting in right now, um, they would normally occupy the space of one computer mainframe. And what he realized and saw as a computer engineer himself was this um, ever-changing technology and the fact that these computer systems were very, very expensive and would also become obsolete in a short period of time. So he created financial models that allowed the consumer or end client or corporate to go in and invest um, a small amount of capital, but still be able to change and take on, take on, um, you know, the goodness of that computer and then allow that computer to transform the business at, at, at hand. And that is really what he decided to do in the standard IT space. Now that evolved in more of what we see um, in the internet of things. And we looked at all these different exotic assets in the meantime, and that exotic asset hardware story changed into things like software, lights, um, smart offices, so lots of different things that I'm going to show you in a bit more detail later on. But he started this literally from scratch, um, and now we are a 10,000 plus employee company, and we are located in 18 countries with 45 years of experience. So there's definitely a place for us, and what we do is very different to you know your traditional high street bank. Um, we work with all different types of clients, from schools into uh, legal practices into uh, construction firms real estate investment firms, um, as well as, you know, day-to-day -day office space. So we, we really have taken, taken on a massive sector expertise or multi-sector expertise in that 45 years of existence. Um, if we move on into the next slide, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more about what is happening at the moment within the sectors that perhaps you operate and own um, companies within and give you a little bit of an idea of how we've helped clients, I guess, in the last year or so, as well as prior, um, uh, conform to a lot of these larger changes. So today, you know, commercial real estate um, owners need to adapt to a, real, a new reality. And I was having a long, deep, and meaningful discussion with a friend of mine who owns a large surveillance firm. Um, and he and I were discussing this really uh, a poignant piece whereby at the moment we have a lot of um, unoccupied space and that unoccupied space needs sometimes people as in physical presence in, in, in actual um, security officers and security guards. And sometimes, you know, there's other ways of looking at, at, at that um, scenario and ways of solving uh, through digital transformation. So I'm going to give you a bit of an example as to a real life example that I've seen in, in a progressive state over the past 10, 20 years. Now, I'm not sure if you remember, but you know, 10, 20 years ago, when you would go to the supermarket or perhaps when you would go to the bank, you know, you always had that person in front of you, whether it was a teller or a checkout um, uh, uh, clerk. And you know, that person was there for a reason, right? In terms of price coding and making sure that everything was paid for and packed up for you in the supermarket example. And then in the banking example, somebody to, you know, hand over, make sure that you were the, you were the person that you say that you were, as well as hand over, um, you know, the cash that you needed from your bank account. Now, think about the evolution of that for a second and think about the fact that 
nowadays when you go to a Sainsbury's, Tesco, Marks and Spencer's, you're really gonna not necessarily have that same personal interaction. You're gonna self scan and pack yourself as well as in a bank, you know, you'll use an ATM on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, my theory stands similarly for, you know, security and surveillance, that there needs to be some kind of disruption there, knowing that you can remotely surveillance, knowing that there is a lot of technology out there, such as drone technology, that sometimes is usable and sometimes isn't, depending on the regulatory environment that, that you work within. But it's definitely something that you can use technology to help you to minimize cost. Because if you think about it, security-wise, you know, you're going to pay through an agency and there's going to be lots of different um, mouths to feed in that transaction. Having one specific su surveillance group uh, looking at it more digitally and looking at lots of unoccupied office space means that you don't have to have the large overheads um, in that in that sense. And that will that will be a large change that I'm envisaging in, in the construction space as well as in the real estate space. But it's something that's become more poignant because of the occupancy issues that we're seeing um, in, in a COVID-19 scenario. So it's something that we've been working with very, very uh, several manufacturers to be able to create long-term financing solutions for large um, investments that could have, you know, a negative effect on capital expenditure up front. That's just one of the little ideas that I wanted to share with you today. But another is really just the challenges that are now currently happening from a vandalism perspective, fires, damages, et cetera. We are in a scenario where not only is there COVID coming, but as you might know, everything to do with the regulatory environment is changing. So for example, in construction, I have some people on the call today from a group called MSOL, who we work with closely. And you know, that's all about making sure that you have the right type of software to avoid things like um, you know, breaches in noise regulation and noise pollution. But there is lots of there are lots of smart solutions out there that yes, cost, but that can create efficiencies and a great return on your investment in, in the medium to long term. In fact, we were working on a transaction across 15, 16 different sites for um, a construction firm recently. And they asked us, you know, how do we create a return on investment? from all of the lighting and all of the infrastructure that we have in the building today um, and change the cash flow profiling to make sure that we are um, spending as little as possible for the first few years and changing up until a point where we're clear and free from a COVID environment. Well, we've been able to do that um, several times over in several different ways. And for us, it's really just about providing you with the right style of, of, of thought process around the financials to make sure that it's affordable, but it also creates a great positive impact um, uh, to your business and the changing environment that you are currently going through. So smart technologies that we're working with at the moment, I talked about surveillance drones, that's one. Things like IoT sensors in the NHS, we worked a lot with the whole COVID um, sterilization piece, as well as we've worked with uh, security monitor um, firms, fire, smoke, water detection, temperature, humidity, environmental monitors. So we've done pretty much everything in both the software and hardware space. So it's gone from this story around computer mainframes and software, which we still do, and we do things like remote working packages and, and, and those types of pieces for law firms when you're working remotely and you need the best kit to be able to maintain your business as usual. But we also go into that more esoteric, exotic piece where we look at all of these different types of smart technology and help clients have those at their disposal um, in the quickest time possible. But again, not requiring that massive capital outlay um, on the outset that perhaps some firms might not necessarily be comfortable in spending at this given time as they are in survival mode. So very much a situation um, whereby in every single instance, when we work with our clients, there is always a positive outcome. And those, that positive outcome really is uh, these few points, which is you know, reducing time, uh, in, in most instances, becoming more cost effective and also just making sure that we've got full oversight from a technology perspective using the right tools. So essentially, smart technology is where, it, is where our expertise lies today across multiple sectors. If we move into the next slide, I'm going to talk to you about um, a couple of different things that we've done across um, the continent in relation to uh, smart offices and also just really um, 
really specific examples that allow me to show you what we've done in practice. So in this example, it was um, part of the Flemish Council in Belgium, and essentially they wanted to look at the sustainability, their sustainability agenda in a little bit more of a, a different way. So it went through a very large public tender where we bid um, against other uh, providers. And what they were looking at was providing, um, well, they were looking for us to help them finance a very large office fit out that included things like flooring, LED furniture, and workplace bundled together in a subscription model and also looking at the cost of running the office, so utilities, cleaning, et cetera. So what we were able to do is look at every single line item of what they wanted and then create one single payment from all of the different suppliers that they needed to use. And that allowed them to you know, do away with a large upfront expenditure, but also do away with all the administration when it comes to supplier management and maintenance. So we were very much there helping them streamline the way they operated, but also looking at the most energy efficient solutions within that. And they were able to look at, you know, the biggest, the best, the brightest because of the fact that we were able to change the cost profile of the transaction. So it was very much a multi-stakeholder process and we had to go through various levels um, of, of approvals. But it's just looking at the as a service mentality and changing this, you know, ownership is a must, which I think culturally in the UK is, 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 is something that we've always looked to. But if you think about other, um, other uh, utilities that perhaps become the day to day today, things like Netflix or, um, you know, just the changing in our own human behaviors, you'll see that ownership perhaps is not as vital as we once thought it was, and a subscription-based economy is where we're moving. And this is a pure and simple example of how that works in practice. So the as-a-service itself was equipment, financing, services, warranty, maintenance, cleaning, swap, and also the most important part, which needs to be more highlighted, is an e-waste plan. Because many a times we're thinking about the procurement of everything, but then what is the end state? Is the end state thought of? Is it something that then gets thought of at the end of, 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 of the ownership or at the end of the life cycle? You know, when does that come into play? And we think about that before you even need to think about it. So in this instance, it was over a nine year program and we looked at e-waste in a way that we could then sit down and think about where was the next best thing. So where is the secondary life for a lot of these assets and where will those go um, in the future and making it as sustainable as possible. So this was an office fit out a finance of 300 plus staff across three sites and three entities. And again, one singular payment for uh, the lifespan of the nine years, as opposed to looking at one large upfront cost um, done you know, in the public sector. If we, move on to, um, if we move on to the next slide, this goes on to essentially give you a bit of feedback that we received. Um, the first one, um, the first piece I have to say about this is really that we always try to act as pioneers when looking at um, circular economy and looking at those types of models and we'll give you advice and guidance as to how we've done that in the past with 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 clients um, around the world that we worked with but really saying that ownership in certain circumstances um, is not as valuable as you think and you eliminate a lot of key risks when going into a subscription style um, uh, model specifically you don't have obsolescence risk and um, your end of life responsibilities are now outsourced to people such as ourselves, um, as well as just saving on um, uh, savings reallocated and budgets being reallocated to things that actually matter to staff and, and employees. So that for me is important, but also if you look at just the quotations around the public tender, um, you know, they really have, described it in the best way, which is really giving up, giving you a win-win rental solution um, to be able to spread payments over time. And that was from the general director of the uh, BVSG. Um, so important that our feedback really stands in line with our reputation around a secondary life 
circular economy and a subscription model um, in essence as a service. So if we move on to the next, here's one that I'd like to um, point out, which is a slightly different sector. It's in the legal sector. So many a times, you know, practice management systems, CRMs, et cetera, um, become a very large, you know, capital outlay. And the reason why is not necessarily for the software itself, but it's actually more for the installation, the usage, the assistance, all the support that sits around it. And here is where, um, you know, one of the top 50 UK law firms, Freeths, you may know them, um, were looking to replace and upgrade their practice management system with a new state-of-the-art software that met you know that met their modern day criteria it allowed them to track to attract talent um having the best technology at their fingertips and here's the thing that isn't said on this page you know in certain circumstances in the legal sector what will happen is you'll have partners that want to retire i call that special situations so different staff changes partners that want to retire and that don't necessarily want to pay a massive upfront cost for um, a practice management system that they won't be using, you know, albeit, but that requ that is required in order for um, to allow the business to evolve. So in those types of circumstances, being able to share and spread the cost out means that you know one, they uh, the firm itself doesn't get that massive capital outlay and that hit, which on exit isn't necessarily going to be a priority um, of of a partner or. Or, or any of the other staff that perhaps are going to have to, you know, pay more or less over a period of time, dependent on their stages of their career within the firm. So this is one of those situations where by amortizing and spreading the cost, you're also, again, allowing yourself to reallocate to other important topics. And in this case, in COVID-19, you know, into a survival mode and reprioritizing um, where that liquidity and capital should go. So the challenges that we faced in this instance was essentially we were looking to protect cash flow and working capital for, for Freets. Um, they were really looking to avoid these heavy, heavy costs, but also um, looking at incorporating multiple suppliers within one transaction. So similar to the office fit out, but in this case, it's more um, professional services, accountancy, legal, where you're looking at a lot of different software, a lot of different services, um, swap outs of those over time um, and, and looking at multiple suppliers in, in one place. So it's also that administrative leg that it would take a couple of people to manage all of those different relationships on an invoicing side where we would do that in, in one flow um, for you. So again, looking at e-monthly um, monthly single fees as opposed to looking at this long-term um, you know, capital expenditure and then obsolescence risk at the at, at the end of, of the life of any of the components within the hardware and software package package that um, Freeze was looking at. So this was a five year solution um, consist, that consisted of this you know practice management system, a lot of consultancy services, maintenance, soft cost installation in one single fee. So it was over five years, it was about 20,000, 19, um, 19 and a half thousand per month over five years, and it took 15 months to roll out. Now, one of the piece, pieces that a lot of our clients will ask us is, in these large types of rollouts, whether it's in the construction industry or within, within legal or anywhere actually, you know, transformation doesn't happen like that. It takes a long time for each individual component to find its place, to be installed, to be settled in. And what we have is a solution that allows you to only pay when that specific piece of uh, equipment or software is in working, functioning. Um, and that is just one of the types of financial solutions that we'll do that's very different to a bank um, because we're really looking at the precision of where actually you're going to start to pay. Um, as opposed to just providing with 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 a capital injection um, or cap or unsecured loan to finance um, this type of work, so it's probably making the, making the actual um, financing solution itself work harder, and essentially you to reap those rewards um, from an interest perspective. So if we move on to freeze a bit of feedback here that's very important, um, but that just gives you an idea that. The feedback when we get for our clients is, is is normally stellar because we're looking for long-term relationships. It's definitely not a one-off hit. 
And in that way, you know, we don't consider ourselves a broker. We consider ourselves like a strategic consultants to know that there is more um, to do, but also uh, it's definitely a hand-holding process for, for many. So this uh, feedback from Simon Owen, who was the finance director there, uh, you know, was was great because he talked about, you know, the method of, you know, smooth transition between legacy and new systems and that ease that means that, you know, you can focus on what the day-to-day -day should look and feel like, which is serving clients, as opposed to thinking too hard and deep about technology vendors and suppliers. Um, benefits itself um, within this transaction, simplicity, the one single payment for multiple invoices, uh, less administrative burden, agility around the cash flows and bank lines that are protected because they are used for critical affairs um, as opposed to um, uh, you know, rollouts, et cetera. And then freedom in terms of cash and the liberation of, of the, that cash to look at more legal cases and more resources um, towards the employees of the firm. If we move on to another um, case study, here's one, um, uh, Wigan, which is also a law firm, but this is actually very difficult, different from, from um, Freed's because this is more around um, mobility. And I think that we have this view that you know, if you go to a carrier um, such as, you know, a Vodafone or an EE, um, that that from a corporate perspective is usually the best option. But what happens in this is that there's usually like a sense of lethargy that you'll go once and then you'll just stick with them for a certain period of time. And what you don't realize is that there are all of these added costs that happen over time. And when you look back and don't make a proper price comparison, especially around mobility, handsets, um, uh, iPads, et cetera, that you aren't necessarily getting the best value for money. So one of the things that we try to do is we look at, and we use many managed service providers to be able to help us in doing this. Um, EACS is one that's on the call today. As we look at everything to do with the package, so the data, um, all of the other added on bolt-ons and we try our very best to break down what you're paying for but also to look at things like changing the data packages so you know they go to they, they're not used on an individual basis you can use more of an economies of scale approach to look at all employees and then see that some might use some more than another but then it can get carried over changed and moved to another as opposed to having you know singular contracts and singular transactions for each employee in their usage because sometimes that can get away with you and it can also create larger overheads than expected um, if you've ever been a person that's had a large data plan um, and then suddenly gone completely over it for travel or other things you'll know what i mean when a bill is normally 20 pounds and then suddenly becomes 300 because you've decided to go cross-border. Well, these types of solutions and consultancy can help alleviate those larger expenditure, monthly expenditures if you have the right people working with you to do that legwork for you and to really give you some price discovery, which is not in the best interest for a Vodafone or a, um, an EE to do. The next piece around this is a funny one, and it's one that is just simple. If, for example, you are in a scenario like I was when I was working at Barclays and you um, have a young child who then drops your phone three, floor, uh, three flights of stairs down, um, down a large building, um, a, a next day swap out at Barclays Bank PLC was not really an option for us. Um, you know, you'd have to wait in the queue, lots of different service hurdles, lots of different tickets need to be raised, and suddenly you're without a phone when you have 9,000 clients. So um, in that instance, uh, this is where we definitely differentiate ourselves, whereby specifically for seat suite individuals, to have a phone is really not an answer uh, for any given period of time. So we try to do next day swap outs and just really try to work with the requirements of our end clients. So really looking at more the service and managed service element of the equation, which as you know, the worst thing is when you're in when you're in trouble to have to call somebody and have a press one, press two, press three, press four, and then it goes back and forth again and again. So this is where um, working with a managed service provider for these elements of price discovery and just looking at the total cost, but also being 100% certain that you're giving your utmost or getting the utmost in service that's where um, we believe we differentiate ourselves. So we were able to do this with Wigan. 
we did this for over a hundred phones, but we've also done this with a construction company in Denmark where we've done, um, the construction company itself has over 38,000 employees and we've done it across 18 countries. So we're pretty good at the mobility piece and we try our very best to make sure that it's price proof, but also create software that allows you to uh, monitor, uh, procure, uh, and look at ticketing if, for example, you get into a into a, um, any kind of faulty faulty handsets, et cetera. So we try our very best to to ensure that we are looking at this in a global way, but also in a local way where you can get somebody on the phone that will actually speak to you and help you through whatever you're going through on on the handset side. So not not very different to the larger conglomerates that are selling the data, but don't necessarily care about the handset and the service around it. That mostly is done in house in large enterprises. So this solution that we provided was 24 months and it was for over 100 iPhones, services, you know, insurance, warranty, um, and again, the e-waste plan. And I say that because we're not thinking about these things now. You know, human beings, we, we think that we do the best um, when it comes to technology and we always want the best kit, but we don't think about what happens after that 24 months. Does it go into a landfill? Does it get reused and recycled? So we'll do all of that as well at the beginning. So um, it also gives you a lot of optionality around increasing um, a state, for example, if more employees come on board in the first 12 months, um, and also terminating early if, for example, you have too many um, too many uh, uh, sets on, um, you know, with or if you're downsizing the organization. Um, and changing um, the FTE footprint of the organization. So we try to be as flexible as possible on that front. So that's a bit more about the mobile technology side that we do um, with Wigan specifically. Uh, and if we move on to the next, well, this one is really, again, just talking about, uh, we call the solution BOSS, so um, business op optimization solution. And again, the head of finance gave us um, a bit of nice feedback in relation to uh, the time of delivery. So three days later, they had um, uh, uh, they had all handsets arrive, and that's really that power of flexibility and time scales um, that we try our best to um, to adhere to. You know, when when working with our clients. Um, Scaling up, scaling down, we talk about, and also the business continuity. So next day swap warranty. I think that when you need it most is probably the thing that you know, you notice the most when you don't have it. Um, if we move on to the next, um, so we've gone through Wigan, we've gone through three, three. This is a business partner that we work with. And this business partner is in the construction and architectural space. Um, this was essentially uh, Janssen, the building company, and their end client was asking them to create an aesthetic ceiling solution. And again, this could be anything when in, in terms of office fit outs or within airports and large infrastructure projects. We've done several, but this was more looking at the entire atmosphere and environment in, in, in the building around heating, cooling, lighting, acoustics, integrated technology, maintenance, cleaning, and it was essentially, you know, how do the, the goal was how do you create this comfort zone? And we called it then, you know, comfort as a service. So creating the right type of environment to do work and creating then a subscription model behind that, which is why Jensen liked liked to work with us and we work with them quite a lot now to this day um, across the continent. If we move on to the next, um, this was not only interior design, but it was also looking at this you know, all of the extra add-ons that perhaps aren't necessarily related to technology, you know, uh, interior finishings, um, insulation protection, maintenance, repair, paintings, um, uh, and total construction, as well as things like sterilized rooms, clean rooms. Um, we do this across various sectors with, Jen with Janssen, but are very good at what we do here in providing the financing models. And we have a long-term relationship, not only with Janssen, but also with their end clients, to make sure that um, you know we're working hand in hand with them, um, MSOL is another group that we work with as well. In uh, that I mentioned before, but we also work with various business partners, so we can some, sometimes point you in the right direction um, if you're looking for a solution but aren't sure which provider to go with. Um, if we move on from the Janssen um, conversation, here's here's one that's another one that is more specific to lighting. 
So in large um, construction projects, lighting can be extremely expensive. Um, and when it, when we look at things like office buildings, hospital, schools, industrial workplaces, we've done all of them in terms of solutions here, again, across the 18 countries where we operate. And sustainable lighting is, is probably, you know, one of the largest outlays that you don't necessarily provision for in, in, in the right amounts. So in this instance, you know, there was a shortfall um, in, a, uh, in a project and they needed to fill that budget gap and we were able to create a better return on investment by doing so with the lighting as a service um, uh, solution. Um, and the lifetime of this can be, you know, 10, 20 years. Um, but normally firms don't really look 10 years ahead with lighting. It's not necessarily a priority of theirs um, in the construction space, but can be. So ETAP, we work with often, it's really more when we, when we work with them, we look at the total package. So soft costs included, installation, maintenance, repairs, um, and the customer rents this lighting via fixed fee that covers all the costs. So again, a monthly or quarterly fee over a period of time. Um, and again, an e-waste plan attached to the end of the, um, to the term. Um, if we move on from ETAP, there's another quick one, um, which is really how we work and what the contractual arrangement can look like. So with ETAP, they are a business partner of ours um, and we will have our own relationship with ETAP, but contractually, we contract with the end client and so essentially we have a lessor lessee arrangement with the end client and then ETAP provides all of the installation maintenance and repairs just as they would if they were to be um, paid directly by the end client. Um, and the customer orders its equipment with ETAP directly um, and we would just need the client and client to say, or if you were the end client to approve the delivery um, before any payment gets made. Um, uh, and that's and that's really it. It's very easy, very simple in terms of the setup of these types of arrangements contractually. Um, if we move on from ETAP, um, we can look at a couple of um, questions that you may have in relation to this. I think that there have been questions coming up on the side panels in the chats, which I can't see. So I'm going to move back to um, Andy and Heather to help out with some of those questions that you may have in the audience. But I thank you for your time. And hopefully um, uh, a few of those questions can, can can help open up some of the examples that I've provided. Thank you very much, Francis. That was really, really informative. We'll just wait for Andy to join us. It's technology. Oh, brilliant. Technology works. Uh, eventually, yes. So. Um, <laughs> I suppose it's a question for me, which is one which a number of clients will always ask, and that is, what, how long does the take-on procedures take for this, and how much time does has, has to be expended on by management in order to get to a position so that the funding can start? Okay, usually we would say the minimum would be about uh, two to three days, but that would be that we'd have to have all the contractual pieces in place, KYC, et cetera, done. Um, but it will normally take in larger projects, it can take a few weeks to do, but we try to expedite as quickly as we can. We work with um, external funders, but we also have our own internal funding sources um, and, and operate essentially as a, as a wholesale bank um, in certain jurisdictions. So we, we can act as quickly as our end clients need us to. Okay, and what sort of financial information would you require to make a decision? We normally need um, up-to-date financials. I think in, in COVID times, those up-to-date financials, I think, pl play more of a part from one or two years uh, back. And then, you know, we'll do a little bit of research ourselves in terms of companies' house for directors, et cetera. And then we'll need a little bit of KYC information. And I think after that, it's a question of looking at the contracts, um, looking and receiving invoices, et cetera, if you've already paid for certain, for certain um, pieces that you want to add to um, the relationship or if it's a brand new project for us to have an idea of the capital outlay or the expenditure that you're looking to, to, to make um, for all the different line items. So um, that's usually what we need up front to be able to not only price a transaction for you, but also to make sure that we can get end-to-end -end, um, credit approval done for you. Excellent. And I think the final question that I've got is in relation 
to fee bills and, and that's some businesses have obviously taken out a C bills loan and have got more debt on their balance sheet than they would have done pre-COVID, but are mm-hmm. fundamentally good businesses. How do you take that into account in your assessment of accessibility? So, you know, essentially, um, for for us, if the CVL program was one of the pieces that they that, that they accessed at the beginning of the crisis, then for us, you know, it doesn't necessarily change the scenario because we don't that CVL will normally be be done with their high street bank or or, or elsewhere. We are looking at um, the whole health of the organization and not necessarily how how much. Um, short-term CBIL leverage that they've taken on. So we try to be as pragmatic as possible, knowing that if the credit history has been strong for, for, for the end client, they've been able to pay back their debts on a regular basis and they have enough um, you know, cash or long-term um, a cash and forecasting uh, inbuilt in, in their planning, then we're normally quite flexible in that respect. So we don't take it as an extra add-on. We kind of see it as um, we as we would see a normal revolving credit facility or any other kind of um, uh, 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 credit line that they might have with the High Street Pan, but it doesn't impede them from looking at anything like this. Thank you, thank you, Francis. Heather. Yeah, I had I had I had one question, Francis. We we you you uh, gave us some fantastic examples across a huge range of projects, from you know, the software to the refitting um, of, of of offices, and they were obviously all of a slightly different size. What is the sweet spot um, for for Ecomicom in terms of a fund, a funding need? So our sweet spot is usually um, it, it it varies, and I would always say that we're open to looking at various different styles of transactions. Um, what we normally will look at is the 500k plus, but again, in these times that will vary. And depending on depending on the need of the client, we're open and we're willing to, to, to have a discussion. I think that one of the things that we understand is that a small transaction today could be a larger transaction tomorrow. So we really try to be as flexible as possible and open up the conversation to see what the goals are and try to align ourselves um, with those goals. And half a million is a really good starting point. What would be the top end um, if someone's looking to put a major uh, um, refurb in? Or so, um, well, we're we're working on projects that are 50, 60, 70, 80 million at the moment. So it's um, very complicated. Um, we yeah. just literally just finished one more in the convenience space. Um, you know, and we, we go into RFPs quite a lot for, you know, that three, three figure millions. So we're pretty, we're pretty flexible on that side too. It's just that usually when it comes to the larger ones, we are, we need a bit more time, obviously, because of RFPs and all of the other ring world that you need to go through, but we're pretty astute on both sides, of the, on both sides of the coin. Yeah. Excellent. And we've got one, a uh, couple of questions here. Um, can you finance a hundred percent of software projects? That is absolutely, yes, we can, is the answer to that. Excellent, yes. thank you very much. Um, and then oh, a question from Dan, Danuta, which I think is going to be relevant to everyone. Will we provide you with the materials which are presented? Yes, absolutely, Danuta. You will get an email after this um, webinar with um, a copy of the slide, or a link to the copy of the slide. So, yes, you will. Um, so, well, it's. Uh, I think our hour is up. I'm sorry, 45 minutes is up. Um, if anyone does have any other questions, post them. We will get back to you directly. Directly. Um, but um, thank you all very, very much for attending. Francis, thank you so much for a really informative presentation. And I can also say a thank you to the back, back, background team that no one ever sees. So Charlotte today has been uh, helping, uh, has been running the webinar in the background for us and dealing with all the technical issues. But there is a huge marketing team at Blick Rothenberg and a massive thank you to all of them for making the, this event ha- happen. Um, any feedback anyone's got, we'd be very, very grateful to receive it. Um, but thank you very, very much and have a great day. Cheers. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye-bye. Bye now.